The next uh, step up in technology for the uh, Edison uh, record uh, company there was the uh, diamond disc phonograph. Now, around the early uh, 19, around 1913, cylinders weren't selling very well. By that time, by 1910, Columbia had, start, had stopped uh, producing cylinders, and Edison was pretty much the only person around, or only company around, selling cylinders. Now, they had a very good technology for their cylinders with the uh, blue Amberola uh, cylinders you saw before, but they could only play four minutes, and they were still far more difficult to reproduce than uh, flat records. Well, Edison wanted to enter the disc market, but he wanted to enter, enter it in a way where he would produce the highest quality machine that was out there, both in terms of like recording quality and durability. So he came up with the diamond disc phonograph, and he stopped calling his records records. He called them recreations because he thought they were that good. Let's hear what one sounds like. This is Just Keep On Smiling. You'll probably recognize the tune. So now you notice a little button down here. This is distinguishes this as the Edison laboratory model. Again, this is pretty much top of the line. They actually built some that were more expensive than this, but then you were paying for furniture rather than technology. One thing, as long as we're sure, that horrible sound you heard before was me trying to adjust this. This is the form of the volume control in an Edison diamond disc. This thing not only moves in and out, it's like a tennis ball that blocks partially the horn. But that's how you control volume in one of these things. Not very effective. <laughs> now, I should make also a point about the price of the Edison uh, phonographs, or phonographs in general to the time. Uh, often the phonographs were uh, uh, had a number after them, and the number usually meant the price. Now the cheapest phonographs were cost about uh, ten dollars, and these were like little key wind-up things called the uh, gem. But you have to remember the prices pretty much from uh, 1900 through even 1913. You would pretty much have to multiply by a factor of 20 to 25 to get them in terms of today's prices. So a twenty-dollar phonograph would be the equivalent of a five hundred-dollar phonograph today. This particular model is a Edison Chippendale 250, a bit of furniture. But the 250 means, yes, this thing cost $250 in 1915, which would have been the equivalent of around $5,000 today. But let's look at some of the technology. First, let's look at the record. The records look an awful lot like your regular Victor records, but notice they're much, much thicker. This is a guarantee that they'll be perfectly flat when they're played on the Edison. The other distinguishing feature is they're still recorded with the hill and dale method. In other words, the needle moved up and down rather than left and right on the victors to reproduce the sound. Another feature is you'll see these little checkered marks on the record label itself. That's actually a strobe disc, so when you hook it up to a 60 hertz light, it'll, it will freeze if you're at the proper speed of, for the Edison's, 80 RPM. Notice he's spinning at 80 RPM rather than 78. You cannot play a Victor record on one of these, and you cannot play uh, an Edison record on a Victor without a special attachment. He tried to corner the market. And again, Edison's approach was always to capture superior technology. He really thought these things sounded a lot better than any of the competition. The other notable advance, too, is it had a diamond stylus on the reproducer rather than a sapphire stylus. This is because they used enormous pressure. These are actually very, very heavy to get the uh, sound levels that he required for this machine. 
because this machine was designed to, to fill an entire hall with sound. Now, just like the cylinders, the tone arm and the uh, needle is driven across the record, not by riding on the groove of the record, but by a feed gear, which unfortunately we can't see. But it's just like the cylinder machine. Once you engage the tone arm, it's driven across the turntable by a feed gear. It uses a folded horn, so the uh, horn, again, is, cannot be seen, but is uh, uh, basically contained within the cabinet. But as you'll see, there's uh, no compromise in the volume. 